before we get into tonight, I want to just give you a little nugget real quick. Um, Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Somebody can hit the lights. Um, But what happens if you only drink water and eat no food? What ends up happening? You get very weak. You don't have a lot of strength in your body. Your body will survive, but you'll get very weak. What happens if you eat a bunch of food, especially a bunch of steak or a bunch of meat with no water? You get indigestion. What Christians tend to do is we usually like the word or the presence more than the other. And we'll drink a lot and never eat. Or we'll eat a lot and never drink. And what ends up happening is, is if I'm only eating from the word and never drinking, I get indigestion. Which means I reach a a spot where I can't take any more in. Because I'm wrestling with it and I'm fighting with it and it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Or the flip side, if I'm not reading the word at all and I'm just drinking, eventually I'm going to come to a spot where I need some some substance in my life because life has kicked the tar out of me and I don't have any substance. And so when I decided to do this, when the Lord put it on my heart and I decided to do it, I knew that this couldn't just be steak night. And it couldn't just be drinks on the house. It had to be both. Because if not, we'll become people who lean one way or the other and we're really no good. But the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. There is no emphasis placed on either one of those. They are equal. I've got to be hungry for His Word and thirsty for His presence. There are going to be times you'll lean one way more than the other. But you've got to have both. Amen? Amen. Last week we dove in, we just cannonballed right in last week, and I'm going to recap it for anybody who wasn't here or in case anybody who missed it. I want to make sure I did this thing right. Hold on. Sorry, Adam, I just unplugged it. Adam will listen to this later. But recap it from last week. Uh, a little bit of a no-brainer here. Faith is essential for the believer. We know this. You, you, you really can't live a life of faith without it. Secondly, we saw from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, that faith has to be in our hearts and in our mouths. It has to be in our hearts and in our mouths. Remember, we're saved by believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth. That's Romans 10. When you believe in your heart... That Jesus Christ is Lord and raised from them, you confess with your mouth, you're saved. Then also we read down in Romans 10, we see that faith comes by hearing. So the more that I speak faith, the more that I hear faith, the more that faith gets in, it gets into my heart. And the more it's in my heart, the more it can come out of my mouth. And the more it comes out of my mouth, the more it goes in my ears. The more it goes in my ears, the more it gets in my heart. And I get this constant cycle of faith coming in, which makes me stronger in faith. The mind, however, is the greatest obstacle to faith. Deuteronomy says it has to be in your hearts and in your mouths, not in your minds. And that was a big distinction we saw last week. Remember John chapter 3 verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And our mind, our brain is flesh. And so the brain, the mind, is attached. We're going to get into more of that tonight. But our mind has to be renewed by what? The Word. Isn't it ironic that our mind is renewed by the same way faith comes? Our mind is renewed by by the Word, and faith comes by hearing the Word. So whenever you are renewing your mind, you're taking in faith. And whenever you're taking in faith, you're renewing your mind. It's the same thing. And so it's important to make sure we catch that. But we're going to dive in again. Some of this I, I said last week. I want to just jump into it a little bit more. Um, John Wesley has a, a statement. He, he talked about uh, having heart faith, which is how we're born again. It's got to be in our hearts, as we've been saying this whole time. But he, he had this other side of it that he called mental ascent. If you don't know who John Wesley is, John Wesley started the Methodist Church. Um, part of the First Great Awakening. Just amazing man of God. And he describes this other deal here as mental ascent, which is essentially, I know I should have it, 
But for some reason, I don't. And I hope it comes. There are a lot of people who think their way through Christianity. And that's what becomes religion. When I'm thinking my way, I'm logically saying, oh, I go to church and I've watched and Josh and Keith do this, so I'm going to do that. And then Jeannie prays like this, so I'm going to pray like Jeannie. And then Courtney does this, and Paige does this. I'm gonna do, it's mental where I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, they're doing this, and they're doing this, so I'm going to do this. But it doesn't get in here. It's mental ascent. And so what happens when I'm going through things religiously, I'm looking at other people, and I'm, I'm hearing the word. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm logically understanding it. Like this is what should be happening, but it isn't. The reason it should be happening but it isn't is because that faith has got, it got log jammed up here. The, the truth got log jammed up here, which is why I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. I heard this at a conference years ago and it blew my mind. There, it's a, Bella, I'm, I'm trying to teach. You could teach one day, but I'm trying to teach tonight, okay? But, look, um, the fivefold offices, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? Fivefold. Only one of them in its own gifting, cannot produce salvation in a sinner. Can you guess which one? The teacher. Because no one can be taught salvation. Can't be taught salvation. Salvation is not a mental thing. That's why Romans 10 says, when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Deuteronomy. It has to be in your heart and in your mouth. When, when, when I started looking at all this, I started realizing, man, this, this whole faith thing really doesn't involve my brain initially. And as we get further into it, we're going to notice the mind is the issue. The mind is, is, is always the issue. When, when you give your life to Jesus, think about this. We're going to get into the Word in a second. Think, I'm just kind of making sure we're all on the same page. When you go to the front, hear a sermon, say the prayer, at life group, at the bar, I don't, whatever it is where you gave your life to Jesus, at no point in time did you understand what was happening. You couldn't articulate in that moment that man, well, my, my spirit was just regenerated. And I'm born again of the Spirit. You couldn't say that. All you knew is that something grabbed a hold of you and you were like, that's different. And I believe that what he's saying is true or what, I, what this person is telling me is true or what the Holy Spirit is doing is true because of what is happening to me. And you felt it and you acted on it. You couldn't articulate it. My, my grandma, Grandma Melda will tell you that she, was, she got saved nine to ten months before she knew she was saved. She knew for a fact, she could tell you the night that the Lord touched her, they were singing just a closer walk with thee at a Catholic charismatic service at some church up in the city. And she said, I felt the Lord touch me and my life has never been the same. I haven't changed since then. It took me nine months and I believe she was at Dove Park when she heard, oh wait, I never said that prayer. But she knew in her spirit that she was different. Her mind had no clue. Because faith has to be in our heart and has to be in our mouths. Now, when we believe in our hearts that salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence, we know this. He then gets to work on sanctifying us. Most of the time, people think the first place that their sanctification process starts is in their actions or in their habits. And it's not. Sanctification doesn't start with you're smoking. It doesn't start with your drinking. It doesn't start with those things. It starts with your mind. Because the number one obstacle to faith is not your smoking habit. The number one obstacle to faith is not your sin habit. The number one obstacle to faith is your mind. And so, the Holy Spirit gets to work on sanctifying us. Go to Romans chapter 12. Now, I know we joked about it, but if I'm going too fast, y'all, y'all yell at me. Don't, don't be bashful. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'm in the New King James. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech ye, or you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He gets to work with our minds. Now, I want you to notice something for a second. We've been noticing the difference between faith got to be in our heart, got to be in our mouth, got to be in our heart, got to be in our mouth, so skipping the mind, the separation there. And as, as I want to make sure that we dive into this because this whole thing is about living by faith. But you're not going to live by faith until you get your mind right. And so as we dive into this, if you look at what it says here, it says to present your bodies and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Verse 1 says present your bodies. And verse 2 says have your mind renewed. So if I come up to you and I, I can't say, um, Courtney, present Courtney. I can say, Courtney, let me see your phone. I can say, Courtney, let me see your shoes. But Courtney can't give me his identity. He can give me something he has, but he can't give me his identity. And so Romans 12.1 is saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now we've heard the statement... Well, I said it last week, that we're three parts. We are a spirit being, we have a soul, and we live in a body. This verse is again reiterating that fact to us by saying, present your body. Not present you, present your body. Why? Because when I'm born again, my spirit doesn't need to be changed. My spirit is born again, it's alive. My spirit is justified, it's sanctified. Read Romans, like, like that happens at salvation. So I have to present the part of me that isn't. The piece that isn't, which is me quoting saying, hey Chris, let me see your phone. Here. He can't say, Chris, let me have your identity. He can take my phone though. I can present myself to him in that manner. So here it's saying, present your body as a living sacrifice. Give the body that I have that is fallen, flawed, and will screw up. If left to be in charge, give that. And then the next verse says to have your mind renewed. That's something else I have to get to work on, renewing my mind. So it's, it's separating the spirit, the soul, and the body here. Now, who is he talking to when he says present your bodies and renew your mind? Thank you for asking. Flip back a page or two to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, just a warning, real quick. If you're not, if you're reading in the NIV or the NLT, you're going to be missing some stuff from this verse, which is kind of the reason why I don't read those much. But, um, therefore now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to The Spirit. According to the Spirit. Look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is Paul again letting us know that there is a separation between who I am spiritually and what I live in physically. Are y'all still with me? Who I am spiritually and what I dwell or live in physically. I have to present what I live in physically to Him so that He can sanctify it. He can help me discipline it. I have to give that to Him. I have to allow Him to renew my mind. My spirit, as long as my spirit is alive, my spirit is good. Because he's the only one that can breathe life to the spirit. Now, I can build myself up 
in my most holy faith. I can add to my spirit. I can be continually filled with the spirit, as Thessalonians says, to be filled or continually filled with the spirit. But I can't give my spirit life. But I can, when my spirit is, to think about this for a second, ready? When you get saved, think of, I'm, I'm Russian, sorry. The mind, while flesh, is the bridge between your body and your soul. When something happens in the flesh, the natural, our minds perceive it both physically. We hear it, feel it, see it, all those things. And then we emotionally receive it. Our minds are what pick up everything that happens. If I hit my hand really hard, bless you, on this column right here, the only reason I know it hurts is because my brain says it does. If I got whatever that disease is that you don't feel pain, whatever that one is, right? My brain is messed up and I wouldn't know that I hurt myself because my mind is messed up. The only reason you know you're offended is because your mind perceives something somebody did as offensive. The only reason that you began lusting after someone is because your mind saw something that it liked, that it knew your flesh liked, and it took it somewhere. Right? So, so the mind is used to being in charge. The mind is used to being in charge because the body feels whatever the mind says it's going to feel. But when I'm saved and I'm born again, the mind is no longer in the driver's seat. The spirit is. Which is why that is the battle we all face. Who's driving the car? Romans 8, as we just looked at, let's go to read one more verse. Romans 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their what? Minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, to the things of the Spirit. When I am allowing my mind to drive, it's going to be set on the things my mind likes. My mind perceives, my mind feels, my mind desires. That's what's going to be driving it. When I'm set on the spirit, my spirit, which is connected to him, which is only alive because of him, my spirit is going to be driving. It's going to be doing what it's led to do by the spirit. Because verse 14 of Romans chapter 8 says, For all those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So when I'm led by the spirit, I'm going to be doing what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. So, it's crucial to understand that because the renewed mind is the mind of Christ. My mind being renewed is the main part of my sanctification process and it is not renewed at salvation. It's not. If it was renewed at salvation, every tendency that you had as a sinner would be gone the moment you got saved. If your mind was renewed at salvation. If your mind was renewed at salvation, why would we have to continually renew it? Because my spirit is fresh and brand new at salvation. I don't have to renew my spirit. It doesn't say renew my spirit. It says renew my mind and sacrifice my body. And renew my mind and sacrifice my body. And die to myself and deny my flesh and take up my cross. And renew your mind by the washing of the word. And renew your mind. Those are what it tells me to do. And so it's obvious here that the obstacle to living by faith is the mind. You might think I'm like beating a drum to death here. I kind of am. Remember, at salvation, our mind no longer holds the seat of being our identity. Our spirit takes that role. Yet the mind and flesh don't want to surrender it. In a very obvious example, think about a person who's homosexual. Their mind and their flesh are their identity. And they are identifying as a homosexual. Which is no different than a fornicator. It's no different than a drug addict. It's no different than any of those things. But I'm using it for a particular purpose in this moment. Because usually an alcoholic doesn't identify as an alcoholic. You have to convince them they are. Right? An addict, you got to be like, hey bro, you an addict. No, I'm not. You an addict. Right? 
But there's a difference in this particular area because a homosexual or a transgender body struggling with their identity, they are embracing the identity. But when I come to Christ, who I was in, the, in, in, in my flesh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. How am I a new creation? Because before him, I was only, I had only two parts alive. My flesh and my soul. But when Jesus comes in, my spirit comes to life. And my spirit gets in the driver's seat. And the Holy Spirit, which brings my spirit life, is always going to push me here. And so, I have to take this, renew my mind with it, renew my mind with it, because my body is going to continually want to do what it used to do. And so I've got to yield and, and, and renew my mind and present my body as a sacrifice. But... My body's going to do what my mind says it's going to do. My, mind, my body will do what my mind says it's going to do. Now, just to show you one more piece of evidence that we're, it's, we are not our flesh, we are not our soul, we are our spirit once we're born again. Look at Luke chapter 16. Luke 16 verse 22. This is the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, wealthy man. I mean, he's a rich, the, the poor man is a rich man. And Lazarus used to eat the scraps of the rich man's table. And dogs would come and lick his sores. Really, really, really disgusting situation, if we're being totally honest. And they both die. Notice what it says in verse 22. So it was... That the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Let me, when I look at this, I want to point something out to you. And the beggar died and was carried by the angels. What was carried? If it was his body, we'd have another Elijah situation here. Right? Like his body, we we don't know where Moses' body went, and we don't know where Elijah's body went. And and if if this was his body, we add him to that list. But he's not Moses or Elijah. His spirit was carried away. But notice how it doesn't say, and his spirit was carried by the angels. It just says he was. Because according to Scripture, I am not my body. I am my spirit. According to scripture, I'm not my body, I am my spirit. That's why when he looks at us, he doesn't see sin, he sees my spirit, which has been washed in the blood. You see what I'm, you gotta, make sure we're catching this. That's why he doesn't see the junk. It's only when I put my flesh and my mind back in the driver's seat that I start looking differently. Now, another example. The difference between our mind and our spirit. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. So why do we say that? We souls. Mm-hmm. What about when we say we save the souls? So when we're talking about saving souls, would that, from my understanding, what that is referring to is when we're saying we're saving souls is because the soul, the mind is the bridge between the flesh and the soul. Right? The spirit is what has to be regenerated. But the only way that somebody's ever going to confess with them out to believe in their heart is if we're winning the soul in the process. Because the hand just does whatever the mind says it's going to do. So that's where the winning part is the soul because it's the emotions, it's the will of a man that surrenders. Not the, not the arm of a man. So that's why when we're winning a soul, we're winning the, the, the interior willpower of that man. But when I'm born again... I'm no longer, that is no longer who I am. I'm spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I lost it, hold on. Verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. Now, look at verse 13 real quick. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, 
Notice that it says, if I speak in a tongue in verse 13, and I pray in a tongue in verse 14, this is a free doctrinal moment. Okay, free doctrinal moment. Speaking in tongues and praying in tongues are two different things. The reason why I know this is because I do not, I only pray to one person, him. I speak to people. I don't pray to you, I pray to him. There is no interpreter needed if I am praying in tongues. Because my audience is him. If I'm speaking in tongues, if the, 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 the person or people that I'm talking to, I'm aiming to, are people, an interpretation must come because what good is it then? A free doctrinal moment. That's why on a Sunday morning, we can pray in the Spirit all day long. But the moment that somebody makes a public address out loud in the Spirit, we have to wait. Because the Lord's going to give someone the interpretation or that person was out of order. That's the way that works. Not Tonight I was, I was singing in the Spirit. I wasn't talking to y'all. I did that all day long. That, that is not for people. I rarely speak in tongues. That's not one of the, now I'll interpret, but I don't usually give a message in tongues. It's just not a gift that, that I necessarily operate in. I've never really pursued it for whatever reason, but it's just not something I operate in. So it's important. People always say, oh, I'm speaking in tongues. Got to have an interpreter. Yeah, for speaking in tongues, not praying in tongues. That's free doctrine for you from 1 Corinthians 14, 13. Look at verse 14. But if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Well, where is your understanding? Your mind. When I pray in the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. When I pray in the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. Why? Because praying in tongues, the source of that is not my mind. The source of that is my spirit. I didn't know you could do this. I heard somebody mention it one time on one of them dead preachers I listened to. He mentioned it one time. And I tried it and it works. He said every time he counseled, he prayed in tongues under his breath. And I'm like, bro, how you, how you speaking or whatever and listening? And he said, I don't need my spirit to listen. I need my ears and my mind to listen. My spirit can pray in the Holy Ghost. And so the next time I was counseling somebody, I tried. And I sat there, and they talked for 25 minutes. And I prayed in the Holy Spirit under my breath for 25 minutes and heard every single word they said. Wow, my spirit man is just getting edified and being super sensitive. And I, I mean, we, we have, I'm good old time. Because the source of praying in the Spirit is not my mind. It's my spirit. Another example of the division between these three things and why faith belongs in our heart. And in our mouths, it's the mind we have to get right. Now, look at verse 15. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. So we got one verse saying that when I pray in the Spirit, my mind is unfruitful. Then the next verse says, I'm a prayer my my." My spirit, I'm going to pray with my understanding. I mean, I'm going to pray in English. I'm going to play with what I know is going on. So this gets confusing. Is what is, what, is, what is going on? Why am I going to pray if I'm not going to understand? Thank you for asking. Flip back over to Romans chapter 8. In case you didn't know, if you don't know what to read, just read Romans 8. You could read Romans 8 every day for the rest of your life, and you'll never, you'll never learn it all. One chapter. Somebody asked me one time if I could only have one chapter from the entire Bible for the rest of my life, it's Romans 8. I have a goal to have the whole thing memorized at some point, and I keep stopping. I'm like halfway through, and I keep stopping. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. The Spirit, Holy Spirit. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
That is saying that when I'm praying in the Spirit and my understanding is unfruitful, it's because I don't know what I'm praying for. I'm just allowing Him to pray through me. And He prays the perfect will of God for my life because He's God. So my under, I don't need to know. As long as He does, I'm good. Somebody knows. Look at verse 27. Now he who searches the what? He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It is amazing to me. Now it jumps out. You ever, you ever been like, think, think about buying a car? And then you drive around for a week and all you see is that car? That's what is happening right now when I read the Bible. Is every time I see searches the heart, tests the heart, tries the heart, I'm realizing he ain't saying mind, is he? He's not saying mind. He's saying heart. Because heart and spirit are are synonyms. They're interchangeable as we saw last week. He searches the heart. Y'all hanging? We good? Right. So when my mind is renewed, back to Romans, sorry, back to 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, back to 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. When my mind is renewed, when my mind is right, that's when I can pray in the Spirit and I'll pray with my understanding. Now, if you've ever been in the middle of prayer and you're praying in tongues, you're praying in the Holy Ghost, and then all of a sudden English comes out. And like all of a sudden now you have something fresh to pray for. Yes. Like I, we praying and praying. This happens a lot. I remember one time we were, uh, Cliff Wilson used to have those bad cluster headaches. And um, I mean like they, the nickname for him was suicide headaches. And one night I get a phone call from Rachel. I, was, I think I was with Brett Sassatore. We were somewhere. And she said, hey, he's having a headache. I've given him two of his shots. A third shot could stop his heart. Uh, we need to pray. And so we left whatever we're doing. We drove over to his house and we're praying. And I walk in and he is on the ground next to his bed. And he's got his hand on the bed, like the bed frame. And he's slamming his head into the bed frame trying to knock himself out. That's how much pain he was in. So we walk in and we, of course, we just start praying all the healing scriptures. They just healing scriptures, healing scriptures, healing scriptures like crazy. And then I didn't know what to pray anymore. So Romans 8, 26 says, when I don't know what to pray, the Spirit prays through me. So I start praying in the Holy Ghost. Start praying in the Holy Ghost. And then after about two minutes of praying in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit told me to start taking, take authority over nerve endings. I ain't got a clue. What in the world? I'm, all I know is I start in Jesus' name, I take authority over his nerve endings. They're going to function like they're supposed to. I start praying the word, but I had this specific thing that Chris would have never thought of praying for. But because my mind is being renewed, the Holy Spirit is able to take things from my spirit and give it to my mind. He's able to cross back and forth. I can pray with my spirit and with my understanding. The renewed mind. Now, how, what what happens, let me rewind because... There's a spot I really want to get to, and I haven't gotten there yet. And so I'm just excited about it, so I'm, I'm trying to slow down and make sure I don't skip stuff. But we see the separation. We understand that faith has to be in our hearts and our mouths. Words got to be in our heart and our mouths. Mind is the issue. So what do we do? How do we wrestle with this? How do we handle the onslaught that our mind faces? Go to Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10, verse 3. Real popular scriptures. Everybody, you know, most people have read this. They've heard this. They've preached about it. We used to sing songs from this verse when I was a kid. For though we walk in the flesh, meaning I got feet and I walk. I'm not walking according to the flesh. I'm walking in the flesh. That's a point of distinction between this verse 
in Romans. I'm not walking according to the flesh. I'm walking in it. We are in this world, not of it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments. Have you ever fought an argument with your elbow? No. You haven't. You haven't fought an argument by punching. You haven't fought an argument by kicking. You fought an argument with your mind. You fought an argument with this. So, we cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Much of what comes to the heart and comes out of the mouth passes through our mind. You want to know how I know that? Have you ever been arguing with your spouse or arguing with your parent or arguing with a friend and all of a sudden something comes out and you're like, whoops. That's not renewed. <laughs> you'd be in your devotion, you'd be loving Jesus and something unrenewed comes out. That is not a word at all. Unrenewed. But it happens. Because the enemy is over there shooting flaming arrows from Ephesians 6. He's shooting flaming arrows all day, every day. Because all he's got to do is get you at a weak, vulnerable moment one time. And if you blow your top one time at the wrong spot, you could cancel somebody's witness and they can have a defense against the Lord for 20 years because you did something dumb at work the one time he caught you slipping. And you may get in your car and drive home and not even know anything of it. And that person like, see, Christians are fake. They fool the devil. They all hypocrites. Why? Because he's just steady shooting. He's just steady shooting. And so, what we have to realize is that we've got to take... Y'all, look at that verse. Cast down every high thing. Every single one. Every single one. I just got tired. Every single one. Well, that's best script. That seems pretty difficult. It is. For you. For you it is. For me it is. But not for the spirit that's in me. So, how do I, how do, I do this? How do I take captive every thought? Well, it says that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Proverbs 4.20 says i got to keep it before my eyes. I have to keep His Word before my eyes. I have to know His Word. I have to know Him. Because the more of Him that I know, the easier I will recognize things that are not of Him. Because that's where the wrestling match is. See, when, when we're supposed to present our bodies as living sacrifices, that also means our emotions, how we feel. Because there are going to be times that your flesh is justified in feeling some kind of way, but because of who is in your spirit, you can't. But we'll never be able to do and live right and handle those things right if we don't take captive every thought. If we're not having our mind read, we won't even recognize it. There are times that I can, I can completely screw up at home and Caitlin can be just, has every right to just rip me a new one and like come at me and be all kind of mean. And that, but she, she don't. Not all the time, anyway. <laughs> Why? Because she has a renewed mind. Amen. There are times I could just go off on her. Don't always do it. Why? Because I got a renewed mind. And the longer that I'm allowing my mind to be renewed, the more renewed it is. The longer I'm with Jesus, the more like Him I become. So, what, what do we do here? Because I've got to have the knowledge of God and then I've got to stay in the Spirit. I've got to stay in the Spirit. There's a hunger and thirst of righteousness, they shall be filled. I've got to stay in the Spirit. Very easily, and you know the difference... Very easily you can be in the flesh and in the spirit and in the flesh and in the spirit. You can feel the difference. If you've been saved any length of time, you will know. 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I was crushed today. Whew. I was crushed today. Or you look back and you're like, Holy Ghost was on me today. Because this happened and this happened and Chris didn't. I got to stay in the spirit. Now, this I've been waiting to get to all night. Because the thoughts still come. So what do I do? Right? Like I could be in my word. I could be praying. I could be having my mind renewed. I could present my body as a living sacrifice. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do. And the thoughts still come. The thoughts of rejection still come. The thoughts of anger still come. The thoughts of prejudice still come. The thoughts of fear still come. Lust still come. All this stuff still comes. What do I do? Go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Now, I need a favor. I need somebody to pull up Romans chapter 4, verse 19 in the ESV. I'm the New King James. If you have ESV, I'm going to need you to read it out loud in a second. Romans 4, 19. Let me read it first in the New King James. I'm going to read it. In let's have you read in the ESV. So, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that he had, he had promised, he was also able to perform. I'm going to read verse 19 again. And he not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, comma, already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Do me a favor. Is that Cody? You got it in the ESV? Read verse 19 in the ESV. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Stop right there. Read it again. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. So stop for a second right now, Lord Jesus, help me. Because the New King James says he did not consider. Yet the ESV said he didn't shrink in faith when he considered. So what did he do? Did he consider or did he not? This is the kind of stuff that doesn't let me sleep at night. Because he considered. He did not consider. That's like, did you eat dinner or did you not eat dinner? I didn't. The problem you run into is, remember, this is written in a different language. Watch. The word that we don't really have a way to say in English without really being complicated. What the verse is actually saying is he considered, then he didn't consider. Or he considered and then he considered not. He did both. Meaning, he acknowledged the reality of the situation and then decided not to consider that a factor. He, he acknowledged I'm old and dead but I'm not going to consider that a factor right now y'all this is huge because this is huge hear me out this is huge most of the time the enemy tries to have us believe that living by faith means dismissing reality the doctor says you have cancer I don't have cancer no dog (laughs) scan says you got cancer and what happens is we deny reality no I don't (laughs) no 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 faith is not denying reality Faith is acknowledging that you have something greater than reality. Abraham considered his body and then decided he wasn't going to consider that in his thinking, in his thought process, and in his acting. 
He was considering it irrelevant. Yeah, I understand, but it don't matter. I understand, but it, 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 I'm not considering that to be the case. So you can be broken hearted and rejected. That can be the reality of your situation. This person left you, this person died, whatever. That is the reality of the situation. But you can consider that and say, yeah, but I'm not going to consider that because I'm loved and accepted and I'm a daughter and I'm a son of God. And I am not allowing the reality of this flesh to supersede the reality of what's in my spirit because heaven doesn't regard me as a flesh. Heaven doesn't regard me as a mind. Heaven regards me as a spirit. And what I have spiritually is more real and more powerful than what I'm facing in the natural. Again, think about Isaiah 53, 5, 4, 5, 4, one of them. He's wounded for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I don't need to be healed if I'm not sick. So denying the illness is not faith. That's ignorance. That's foolishness. No, recognizing, I got that, but I'm healed in Jesus' name. Because he paid for it 2,000 years ago. That is faith. That is considering, that's what the situation, hey, Bethany, that's what the situation is. But I'm not considering that. I'm not factoring that in. I am not letting that into my decision. I'm taking that thought captive, and I'm bringing it to obedience of Christ that says, no, in him, I don't have to worry about this, because he's greater than that. So tomorrow, you have to consider to not consider. You have to recognize that living by faith does not mean denying reality. Living by faith is not denying reality. Living by faith is saying, that's reality, but what I have is greater than the reality I'm facing. This 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 is huge. I prayed. Y'all know the deal. My back a couple weeks ago, Sunday I couldn't stand up straight. It was a the pain was in a completely different spot than it has been for the past fifteen years. I was all I was so down Sunday afternoon on Father's Day. I was so discouraged. Here I am preaching on faith, teaching on faith. My back's hurting again. And something got up in me and said, "Uh uh-huh, it is. But that doesn't matter because I've got something greater than this back pain. That, see, when I consider and I recognize the reality, I don't dismiss it. And when I'm recognizing the reality, that's what gives me the ability to live by faith. I don't need faith when my back isn't hurting. I need faith when it is. I don't need faith to be healed when I get my healing. I have it. I need faith before. Brianna doesn't need faith that she's going to be a mom while she's holding Arabella. She needed faith that she was going to be a mom before she held Arabella. And she had to look at the reality of another test and another test and another test. She couldn't deny it. This test is wrong. I'm pregnant. No, you're not. Not that much. She couldn't give in to, oh, but if she accepts that reality, I'm never going to get pregnant. No, I'm going to consider this. This is what it is. And then I'm going to say, but I'm not accepting this because I've got something greater than it. I'm hitting this over and over again because this right here is the key to having your mind renewed and walking by faith. Abraham, y'all when I read that, I was so aggravated with the Bible. I'm like, why you got to do this to me? Because it said he considered, and he didn't. That's confusing. Help me, Jesus. Let's keep keep going a little bit. God wasn't asking Joshua to deny Jericho had giant walls. God wasn't asking David to deny that Goliath wasn't massive. He wasn't asking Peter and John to deny that the man at the temple gate was lame. God was asking them to believe that he was greater than what was right in front of them. 
Now, look at verse Romans chapter 4, verse 20. He did not waver. He didn't waver. Now that right there is the that's the part that, that we, we struggle with. Because you can have a good day on Wednesday, but Thursday might be tough. Right? Third, and something may set you off where you're where I'm struggling. See, you can struggle. But the moment that we start going from I'm considering this and considering that. And I'm considering this and I'm considering that. And I'm considering this and I'm considering... When I go back from that, I become like James 1 says, a man who's tossed like a wave on the sea. And it's unstable in all of his ways. No, I can't do that. I have to make my decision that this is the report of the Lord. Isaiah, whose report will you believe? Who should believe the report? This is what it says. I'm going to stand on this. I'm not going to waver. And when this stuff rises up, I'm going to take it, recognize it, bring it here. This isn't this. And I'm going to cast it down. And the next day, something else comes. I'm going to grab it, bring it over here. This doesn't match this. And I'm going to toss it. What do we normally do? We complain. When those thoughts come, we grab it and we identify by it and we keep it and we live in it. And then people wonder why... We don't have any strength because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord doesn't come from rehearsing your problem. The joy of the Lord comes from the Lord. Where is He at? In the Spirit. Now, look at verse... Let's keep reading. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. The more... That we consider and then get rid of it to have the, the, the faith that we're standing in. The more I do that, the stronger I get in faith. The more that I make the decision that I'm not going to come out of agreement with this. That I hold this. The more I do that, the stronger faith is. The stronger I get in faith. He didn't waver. He was strengthened in faith. And being fully Convinced. Please hear, catch this verse. This is enormous. Being fully convinced that what he had promised, he being God, he was also able to perform. Notice it doesn't say that he was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was going to get exactly that way when he wanted it. He was convinced that he who had promised was able to do what he said he was going to do. I'm preaching a little bit about this Sunday. One of the biggest mistakes we make is when we allow what we're believing for to be hijacked by our imagination and we begin to paint the picture of what it's going to look like. And then we start praying for an imaginative thing which sets up an unmet expectation which actually causes us to get hurt more and consider the things we shouldn't be. All because we didn't recognize that I'm not believing that God's going to give me what I want. God is not Robin Williams the genie from Aladdin. No, I'm believing that he is absolutely capable of doing the very thing he said he's going to do. And if he decides to do that at 37 or 38 or 48 or 58 or 98, I don't care. I am fully convinced that he is capable of doing what he said he's going to do. Are you? Now, now hear me out. You might be right now after that anointed worship and an hour in Scripture. But you've got to be like that tomorrow. You've got to be like that the next day. You've got to be like that the next day. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to consider the reality and then I'm not taking that. I'm going with this. It might be 25. Y'all... Some of y'all remember Miss Rita, Pastor Bonnie's mom. She got saved at the end of the 60s. And Mr. Jerry was not saved. And he told her, you got to pick me or Jesus. And Rita picked Jesus. And she came home one night from service. And she was in the bathroom. I'll never forget the story. She used to cry every time she told it. And she was sitting on the floor of the bathroom. And she was banging her head. Against the wall. I can't live like this no more. I can't live like this no more. And the next day, I forgot how it went down, but the next day, 
Mr. Jerry basically said, you, you can have Jesus. But i got to be number two. He can be number one. That was in the late 60s, early 70s. That man gave his life to Katrina, like right before Katrina. We're talking 30 plus years of her having to consider and then not consider to stand on what faith said. 30 plus years. Some of us have been holding out since Thursday. And we're getting weary and well doing, and it's been six days. But but I'll tell you what right now. You go let Miss Rita pray for just about anything. She is fully convinced that he is able to perform what he said he's going to do. Why? Because she stood for 35 years and worked that muscle of, I know what's right in front of me, but what is in here, what he's promised is greater than what's in front of me. So I'm not going to deny it exists. I'm just not going to say that that's the reality I'm living by. This is over and over and over and over and over again. I think Cody, when we went into Walmart one time, and right before, this is right before Katrina, and we walk in, and Miss Rita, like one of the holiest people ever, at least in the parish for sure, <laughs> is walking through Walmart with a 24 pack of Bud Light. And I'm like, she's gonna die if she drinks this. She's so small. She will die, right? I know why she had it. Right? I know why. She come up to us. You remember this? Listen, listen, listen. This is for Mr. Jerry. This isn't for me. Like, baby girl, I know you could. No worries. You, you would die. Your liver would shut down if you drank all of that. Ain't no way. No. She didn't waver. She stood. She stood. She stood. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the greatest step of faith you'll ever take isn't a step, it's a stand. Well, I'm just not moving. I'm not moving. The greatest step you'll ever take is a stand. I'm not moving. I know my son, I know my daughter is out being stupid. I'm not moving. I know my marriage is... A great ball of fire. I'm not moving. I know my finances are a wreck. I'm not moving. I'm not denying the reality. Y'all want to? That changed me when I when I had that revelation. And again, it's not a revelation. It's information. It's just understanding what the Bible actually says. This isn't Rama. This is Logos. Abraham considered his condition and then decided that it was irrelevant for the situation. That, that, that shed such a shift in me. That what's right in front of me isn't what matters. But I'm not going to deny it. Because if I deny it, I don't have a testimony. The reason that we can all rejoice with Rand and Raph is because we know the story. If they would have just denied the story, we wouldn't have a testimony. God is working something in all of us. The perseverance, the testing of our faith, all of that is so that we become stronger. We become more like Him. We become more sensitive to His Spirit. Because remember, there are some days where you're going to be standing and it's going to be 100 mile an hour winds and everything is collapsing around you. You've got to be in the Spirit. You've got to be praying in the Holy Ghost. Sometimes that's all you can do. Listen, in the, last, in the last few years, pretty much since I've been pastor, like the whole time, there have been times, I, I, I won't give the details, I'll just tell this, I had to make a phone call to Miss Christine about four years ago. And I've known Miss Christine, Miss Christine was in a choir, like I was in elementary school, right? We go back like forever. And I had to call Miss Christine. And I was so worked up emotionally. I was such a wreck. That I literally drove from the church to Florissant Highway. And then back up. I didn't call until I got back to Gerald's. Prayed in the Holy Ghost the whole time. I didn't know what else to do. I had reached the end 
of Chris's ability to quote scripture, to sing. I'd done sung all the songs. I'd done quoted all the scripture. And I had I'd gotten to the end of that spot. And, and I, I just had to pray in the Holy Ghost. That's all I could do. But guess what? Now, I can go a little longer. I can stand a little longer. Yeah. I can withstand a little bit more. I can rebuke the enemy a little bit more. Why? Because of that night. And other nights like that. I'm stronger in faith than I used to be. Why? Because I had to be tested. I've gotten better at considering to not consider. I've gotten better at recognizing that what's in me is greater than the reality in front of me. No matter how ugly it is, no matter how dead it is. Abraham was 99 years old. And he decided that that didn't matter when it came to God giving him a promise. He's going to have a kid. He's 99. That stuff didn't work no more. <laughs> and he, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Because he who is promised is faithful. Yeah. So I want to encourage you as we leave. I'm going a little longer tonight. As we leave, as you go, try to do a better job. Try to do a more intentional job of recognizing this is the reality. This is how I feel. And I'm justified to feel this way because that person's an idiot. Or whatever. But that is not the reality I'm basing my life upon. I'm getting that away. And I'm standing on who He is. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You for tonight. Holy Spirit, I thank You that You are teaching us and You're leading us. Father, I pray that as we keep going over the next few weeks here with this, I pray that You would cause us to grow in our faith. You'd cause us to grow in our desire for You. That we would be hungry and thirsty for Your presence and for Your Word. I pray that as we stand in faith, You would help us to Consider to not consider the reality so that we can stand on what your word says because we know that you have promised and you were faithful. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.